Yep, I see him. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. We have five board members on right now. We need one more to start. Actually, I can't count. We have enough to start. Okay, we do. We do. Give it one. One minute. We can get moving. Uh, all right, I'll this, I will call the water and sewer board meeting to order. Um, and Brenda will ask you to take roll. Board member Bariski. Present. Board member Mercier. Board member Ridley. Present. Board member Roth. Present. Board member Freeman. Present. Council member Anderson. Council member Woodward. Council member Woodward. Present. Okay. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Sierra. Vice Chair Habenick. Here. And Chair Moore. Present. Okay. Uh, ne next on the agenda, approval of the minutes from our June 14th meeting. Uh, can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. And wonderful. Any discussion? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, motion, motion carries. Um, is, Brenda, is there any public forum tonight? Um, just the variance that is on the agenda already, but we didn't have anyone right. else attend or ask for a public comment tonight. Okay, wonderful. Uh, then with that, uh, we'll move on to agenda item 5A. Uh, with a variance request. And uh, I'm sorry, am I handing it over to staff or to the guests, to the, the requester? I'm gonna be running the slides for um, the requester. Just give me okay. a second to pull up my screen. Sounds good. Okay, uh, Brenda, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Am I all set to go? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. 
Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Jeff Geeson, and uh, I am the owner at 3106 and 3110 South Tacoma. Uh, Brenda, if you can advance. Uh, I just want to give you a little history about what we're trying to do here. Um, so this is a duplex property, obviously. You can hit it again, Brenda. And uh, so I've owned this property for about 11 years. I bought it. I uh, updated it. Uh, I added garage, added storage, uh, you know, fixed it up from where it was. It was actually uh, a foreclosure. And so I established um, essentially a quality rental option in the area. I uh, rented it out, had the same tenants until just recently for 11 years. Um, I had this property well maintained. Uh, it's very, very well known in the neighborhood. It's uh, It's uh, got sprinkler system and uh, bushes, plants. It's, it's a very nice property. And so Next, Brenda. Um, as you can imagine, owning that property from 2011, I've uh, established a lot of equity in that property. And so I was talking to some advisors and uh, financial folks trying to figure out what to do with that equity. And we decided that it was best to, to sell, sell the property. And so I've been looking at options on, on what to do. And I've been working with uh, Red Tea Homes on some other investment opportunities, not unlike what's going on in, in a lot of parts of Englewood where we're building two and three and four unit townhomes. So I was talking to them about some of the options for the property. And what they <clears throat> advise is they're actually doing, um, similar to what they're doing with, with scrape options, but they're creating ownership opportunities in other areas. So parceling out, splitting up the property, and then selling the units individually. Um, so they're serving as a star of marketplace. So, um, we decided to look into actually doing that. So you can go next, Brenda. So we began working with the city in November of last year and having some conversations and, and exploring this. And so um, working back and forth with Red Tea, uh, Red Tea has done this. So they, they've been working with the city pretty closely. And we ended up uh, putting together a proposal. We, we went and surveyed, put a new survey together, proposed a splitting of the property, uh, put together a party wall agreement with uh, covenants and restrictions. And um, throughout that process, there was no perceived or, excuse me, objections. So we kept moving forward the process. Once we submitted uh, the final paperwork, uh, we ended up um, uh, having an objection. And at the time, given that we had no perceived objections, I, I started working on upgrades, roof structural electrical upgrades, um, currently ready for internal upgrades. Next, Brenda. But through that submittal, obviously, and that's why we're here tonight, you guys uh, should have seen that Water and Sewer Board had said, all right, we need to put in separate water sewer lines. <clears throat> and uh, that's kind of where we've uh, where we've gotten stuck right now. So that's why we're here. So um, we've done uh, some research. We've gotten estimates for water and sewer tap fees, estimates for what it would take um, to do that work. And what I wanted to show you, I mean, it's very, it's easy to look at a 2D drawing and Look at the survey plat and think, well, yeah, let's let's add water sewer. I kind of want to show it to you uh, in person. So, Brenda, if you go to the next slide. So this is an aerial view of the property, and you can see that it's a uh, it's a front back duplex that's slightly offset, and the green lines are showing the existing um, water and existing sewer lines. So you can see it comes in the south side of 3106, the front, and then it go the sewer goes out the uh, south side of, of uh, 3110 there. So in order to add new water and sewer, you know, we'd have to look at the red lines there. So we would have to bring in a new line from the street all the way across the yard into the front of 3110. Uh, and actually with that picture, it looks like 3106 is in the back, but actually 3106 is in the, in the front. And then we'd have to add sewer to the back of 3106, which is up at that north part of the property We'd have to come back and then cross over the entire yard and then go back out to, to the alleyway there. <clears throat> so if you advance one more, Brenda, um, here's a picture of the front yard. Uh, so this is essentially channeling right where we'd have to put the water line uh, across all that yard. Uh, you can see this is well-maintained. Got my rose bushes that were there when I bought the property and have somehow managed to survive. Um, but obviously we have to dig up a, a large portion of the yard uh, in order to make this happen. If you advance again, Brenda, uh, this is uh, on the left on the left picture there. This is in the backyard of 3106, standing out looking uh, to the uh, west. So you can see there we have on the left side, we have our uh, a shed there. 
and that goes for seven, eight feet over to the property line. So you can see in order to put the water or, sewer, or the sewer line in, we'd have to dig up all that cement, part of that step and potentially that uh, porch there and uh, go out back to where that step is back there. The second picture is me standing on that step, uh, turned 45 degrees. We would have to come all the way across that existing yard and then, uh, then angle out back towards uh, the alleyway, which you can see in the third picture. Um, now we've got that large tree there that's in the way, large established tree as well. So I don't know digging up the yard, what that'll do to that tree, if that'll kill that tree or not. So you can see we've got established uh, property here that um, you know, coming in and digging up uh, would be quite, quite the disturbance. Um, <clears throat> so Brenda, if you could uh, go on more. So bottom line, we're, we're requesting an exception to this ruling that we need to add the water sewer. Um, Brenda, you can go one more. Um, <clears throat> looking at this, um, we've got, uh, from what we can tell, we've got some comparison, at least one comparison, 3202 Sherman, that, uh, that did not have to add these water sewer lines, and they did something very similar, and that's what we modeled this off of. Um, I understand if this was new construction, uh, if we did a scrape, for instance, we would, we would absolutely uh, be looking at putting in the new water and sewer. Uh, but in this case, we don't really see that the situation is any different than what I had as a rental uh, landlord. If I wasn't paying the water bills, neither of my uh, tenants would get uh, water. I, th I think with, with this ruling, we're trying to prevent the situation where one, one homeowner is dependent on another, um, which I understand. But like I said, I don't think that's much different than what I have today as a, as a rental owner. Um, and we've actually accounted for that in the uh, party wall agreement, uh, just like any other homeowners association. Um, we also, that you know, <clears throat> doing this work uh, is going to add a couple months to our effort here. So if we didn't have to do that, we got quicker time to market. We can create an ownership opportunity in this uh, <clears throat> in this market range sooner, you know, before the rates rise again, which, as we have heard, will, will likely happen. And then also, you know, like I said, we're, we're aligning with, you know, the other property that's out there that seems to have done this without any need to put in the water sewer. So <clears throat> that's that's the that's my story. Um, next slide, Brenda. Um, Thanks for the consideration. Um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. That's what we're looking to do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Geeson. I'm gonna suggest we go ahead and hear uh, from staff and then if it's okay, okay with the board, we'll take questions at that time. Um, So I'll turn this over to Sarah to um, to give us staff uh, staff feedback and um, recommendation on this. Okay, let me just share my screen. Good evening, everyone. Do you all see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yes. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just give a, a little bit of background of, of staff's um, research into this uh, application or variance request up to this point. Um, the property owner did submit a minor subdivision permit to the city of Inglewood in March uh, 2022 to split the property. As you can see here on the map, um, it splits it bet in between the uh, duplex and the water line is shown in blue going to the front of the property. And then the sewer line, single sewer line service is shown going to the back of the property in green. Um, so following that review of the permit, utility staff did not approve it as there was just the single service lines to the property. Um, and per city code, um, we do not allow for um, a single service line to multiple properties. So I've, I've highlighted the relevant, relevant um, language from city code section 12, dash 1B dash 7 dash A um, that talks about the single or talks about needing a single service line to each property um, and that an extension of service cannot be from another property. Um, and then the exemptions to this uh, requirement can be granted by the city manager and um, by the water sewer board. So that is uh, what we're talking about tonight. So following submittal of the variance request, um, staff did take a look into the example, um, and that occurred in 2018, 
where the pro a property was um, allowed to be served off of, a, two properties were allowed to be served off of one single line. Um, at the time um, that was approved, we did not have record of why that was approved. That engineer is no longer with the city and it's not a current practice of the utilities department to allow a single service connection to multiple properties at this time. Um, so staff recommends denying this request um, as there's an option to add a sewer line and a water line to each uh, unit of the duplex. Um, if there's only the single service line, the city cannot bill the individual property owners appropriately and therefore cannot shut off or do maintenance activities with, um, without agreement from both property owners. Uh, there would also be required to have some kind of shared maintenance responsibility between the two property owners for any section of the service line that is on uh, private property. This isn't industry standard and it really creates a legacy problem that we, that, that uh, utility would have to deal with for for years to come. So our recommendation, staff's recommendation is to deny the request. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Uh, right, Ty, you want to go ahead? Yes, yeah, so I have a question for Jeff here. Um, are you more are you at motivated here by by the current uh, tap fees that that you're facing or does it have more to do with the actual putting the infrastructure in or a combination of both? What was kind of your main motivating factor in asking for this variance? Really a combination of both. Um, it's it's about a forty five thousand dollar endeavor. I've also got a sprinkler system in there that will have to be totally. You know, I mean, obviously it would be damaged by the water line coming in, but would have to be totally reconfigured to be run off too. So all that, the expense, the time is the motivation here, correct? Thanks. Jim? I, I have a question on the party wall agreement. How do you have that set up uh, to provide for both owners. So <clears throat> the agreement calls for both owners uh, being responsible for 50% of each of the, of anything that's shared. Uh, so there's essentially, you're putting together an association that has to fund um, uh, an account to pay for those, those uh, items monthly as, as well as any kind of maintenance. There are easement agreements in the party wall agreement for the properties. Um, so that uh, so that utility so maintenance can be done. Uh, it would have to you would have to talk to two owners. I, I agree with uh, Sarah on that, but it, it is called for in that party wall agreement. Would there uh, would there be some sort of fund that you would pay in advance so there was a certain amount of money deposited for for that type of thing? And who's gonna, who's? I assume the two owners. I'm sorry, Jim. I, I think you broke out. You broke out for me. Could you repeat that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I said I assume the two owners of the property, the two new owners. Mm -hmm. Would be dealing with the. The payment or so is there an escrow for future future bills there is a call out i believe for for an account to be held there is not a specific dollar amount that has been instated such um but those are changes that could certainly be added if if that was uh, desired okay thank you uh, Don and then Ty. Well, I, I have a question. I, the, the division of the property seems like that would create a nonconformity. I, I don't see how zoning would, how that would pass zoning. So you have a lot with less than a 25 foot frontage, which means that could never be built on if something happened to it. That I'm not sure. I don't know if Red T has an answer, has, has some input on that. 
Hi there. Um, this is Gavin with Red T Homes. Um, I'm actually pulling up the um, review comments. Um, we did go through zoning. Um, I, I know that that was the first thing we checked with because we were also concerned about that. Um, and the zoning uh, was reviewed and approved in our initial submittal for condominiumization. Um, I'll work on pulling up that exact note from the uh, city reviewer. And, and Sarah, I believe that's consistent. I mean, that was my understanding is that a duplex lot can be divided for ownership reasons. And so that, um, I kind of Donna had the same reaction as you initially, but I think that with duplexes, splitting the ownership is, uh, is allowable. Um, I mean, I assume the notes we'll see will confirm that, but. Yeah, it, it is my understanding that's allowable as well. Um, the city notes for this particular review back in March um, did include approval through all departments except through utilities where it was hung up on the single water and service line, sewer service line. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'll hold a minute for red tea if there's something else you want to add. Oh, no, no, that, that covers my question. Okay, thanks, Don. Uh, Ty, did you have another? Yeah, I had a question for Sarah. Um, I was just curious if there have been um, much other interest in these types of, of duplex subdivisions where there's not you know, complete scrapes happening. And if so, has the city considered discounted system development charges? Since I'm guessing you know, it would be similar usage on, on both sides. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll address that one, Ty. I think this is this is the first one we've run across. I think um, from a, so, so I think there's two pieces to this. One, there's the physical infrastructure to the to the property. And um, we understand that there's a cost to that. And, and that's, you know, part of splitting a property. So if you were to do a scrape, you'd be putting in two new duplexes, two new sets of services. So the, the fortunate situation about this circumstance is you don't have to scrape the house. But, we, but it's a bad practice to have owners uh, subservient to other homeowners. It, it just creates a problem, not just for the utility, but it, for, the, for, the like, for the owners of the properties, because it doesn't give them their own, um, their own dedicated service for water and sewer, which is a primary function uh, required by the utilities department. So it's a bad practice. We, do, we think it, you know, it sets up a, uh, it sets up a, uh, uh, slippery slope in terms of a precedent. I mean, the, there was the reference back to the property that was that was allowed to do this prior to any of the work that we've done over the last few years to modernize this utility. So I think that that's a legacy of, of somewhat the way the utilities department uh, operated in a, in, you know, the, in the uh, fashion like we used to talk about, uh, like we have talked about. So, I think from a from a matter of practice perspective, moving forward, this is something. This is why we made the recommendation from a from a service perspective. As it relates to tap fees, um, I think on tap fees we would have to go back and, and evaluate that because I think there is there is an argument to be made that says that the demand does not change because it's not putting two new two story um, two story. Uh, uh, duplexes on it. It's the same size duplexes, it's the same water demand, it's the same sewer demand. So in reality, the demand on the system doesn't really change. So I think the tap fees is a piece that we could actually work with because there is a rationale that I think is defensible, that's uh, defensible for um, for the utility to stand on to say that the even though we're splitting it into two services, there is a there the, the perceived demand on the system or the, the actual demand on the system or potential future demand does not increase. So that's something I think we could work with. I think is again, back to the physical infrastructure, it's, it, it sets, it's a bad precedent and it sets up a, a long-term challenge for not just the utility, but the homeowners themselves. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, I, I agree, it definitely. It, it seems like it makes sense to have separate services 
Um, I guess then that's that other slippery slope too. If you discount it, then what happens if at some point down the line, it does get taken down, then, you know, do you have to reevaluate that tap size again, if there's two services? So I know that, you know, there's a lot to consider with, with that programmatically. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's a great point. And so you're trying to somewhat predict the future on this. So I think, you, you know, if the, if the prop, property does do a scrape in the future and now they've gotten two taps without paying the tap fees and then they increase the overall demand, um, really what you'd have to do is you'd have to stick a note associated with the plat or a note associated with the uh, some kind of record on it that says that if this property is to redevelop, a, a tap fee must be paid, but then which one do you assess it to? Do you assess it, you know, does one get assessed but the other one doesn't get assessed? So, I mean, I, to me, that's somewhat of a, a lower risk issue um, that uh, could be potentially considered by the board. Um, but, you, but you're right, there is, that, there is that future risk that it redevelops. Thanks. Uh, Red T. Holmes. Uh, we have a couple questions about that. Um, I guess the first one being that typically when we set up these party walls, they are set up in a way so a management company handles all of the divvying up of payments that are due to utilities. So typically that managing entity would wear the burden of managing those utilities with payment with regards to those utility companies. So we believe that burden would actually lie on that management company and not on the individual utilities to keep up with those shared services. And then the second bit was um, if we were granted this variance and let's say in the future, this property were to be redeveloped, scraped and rebuilt as we're um, theorizing, in that system, I believe our understanding is that that project and that owner would then be required to go through the full development process where they would then be identifying what their tap desires and needs would be as well as their demands. And then it's our understanding that that's when they would catch the taps being allocated properly or improperly based on their future uses. And then that's when they would get saddled with that charge. Do we have something another one? Well, so I, I think I can respond to the, the second one first. And so the code says, the code establishes pretty clearly this right now and you're, you're redeveloping the property. You're not necessarily tearing the buildings down and, and putting in new, uh, new houses or new duplex, but you're, you're in that moment right now, which is why the, the code is in place to address exactly the issue that you're pointing out a future, a future entity should resolve. Um, so I, I think the, the, the reason why the code is established is to, uh, to allow for, with this property, you are dividing it into two distinctly separate properties with, two, with a property line that runs right down the middle from, one, from the front property line to the back property line. So you're essentially creating two single family residences. And those two single family residences, from a, from a matter of practice and a matter of, of, of code, require separate water and sewer services. And so I think that, you know, the process is, you, we're in the process right now because this property is quote unquote being redeveloped from what it was originally developed as. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I guess uh, the only other question we would have is how, are, um, I guess, like townhomes set up in Inglewood currently. Um, in our experience in other municipalities, we've, um, again, as Dan mentioned, had the party wall management company kind of um, running as the, the point person for all types of utility mm -hmm. uh, issues, whether it's water, sewer, how to divvy things up. Uh, making sure that everybody's paying, uh, and then obviously making sure that the city is getting paid and has any easement access that they need for maintenance or upgrades or anything like that. Um, and I was curious, uh, I guess, is that something that you guys have in the code currently? For townhomes? For townhomes or, or something like that, or condos. I mean, 
since, as you mentioned before, we're not really changing the demand or anything like that. Um, and if it is an issue of having, um, you know, two lines because there's two separate people living in two separate places, um, why wouldn't uh, wouldn't a townhome style agreement work? Is there some way we can meet that requirement um, and make sure that you guys have what you need from us? So I, I can't I can't address that right now. I can address the request and the code as it states right now. I also can't address what's approved in other cities. I can go off of what the city of Englewood code is. And we've highlighted those provisions in the code. And that's that's essentially where we're at right now is is you're requesting to split it into two distinctly different properties. They do share a common wall because they were set up as a duplex. And the code states that they require separate water and sewer services, which frankly is an industry standard practice. It's not, it's not an abnormal practice. And it's a good long-term practice for the two individuals who are going to be owning those properties well into the future. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you very much, Peter. Marshawn? Um, thank, thank you for taking, taking the time to hear what I have to say. I, I sadly have to say, um, Jeff, that I actually knew of a person that went through the exact scenario we're speaking about. And on, it was so unfortunate because when the property was sold, um, they end up having a huge debate at the court because um, they were like, who is in charge of this? And then they're like having arguments about this you know, you're in the front, it is in your front yard, and this is this. And then they had, it was a huge, big ordeal for this individual. So I can totally see Sarah's and, and Peter's uh, argument about this, that they, they, the peace of mind a, a residence needs to have in the future. We can't just kick this can down the road and then just hope that somehow it ends up in a safe place. Um, and you never know what the people are just getting. So I have to say, I can completely can see Peter's and Sarah's point of view. Um, so. Thank you. Um, I'll raise my hand. Uh, I'd like to, um, I'm always concerned about board precedent um, and uh, both with respect to this 2018, <laughs> Um, variance that apparently was granted as well as other times where we haven't granted. So let me, let me start with that latter one. Do we have a board history of denying requests like this or is this literally number two that we faced? John, did, we, did the board get the original one, the, the one that was cited from 2018? Did that go through this board? Well, that, that was going to be my next question because we should have uh, meeting uh, minutes from that if that were the case. So maybe we can start with, maybe that one's easier to start with. Sarah, do you know? So from our records, that was approved by staff at the time and did not come to the water sewer board. Um, uh, pause to say, wow. Um, that's not new code section, right? No, With so I concurrent. think under, under the, uh, the original review, the, the engineer was able to review it and provided it under that initial, um, uh, I'm losing the, the right term, the, um, the plat, not the plat, the uh, permit, excuse me, the subdivision permit um they it was the purview of the staff to review it as a part of the city's process there wasn't a specific variance request that came to the board and and just to add to that i think if you go back to the language in the code it says city manager or designee or or water and sewer board and so it, it could have been a situation where back then it, it, is that what the line that language has city manager or designee mm -hmm. And so, yeah, but with, 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 with the with water and sewer, board. sure. Right. There, and, there, if, the, if this board didn't concur, explicitly concur, then I'll need to dwell on it. But that doesn't seem like that. Anyway, seems like the we, board should have been opining on that prior one. 
we agree 100%, which is why we brought this one to you. Again, this is, 2018 is, is a legacy period for this utility. And it's uh, things that we are, the processes that weren't always followed to the letter of the code. And so we're trying to ensure that those types of situations don't recur so that we don't have situations which we're trying to explain why a decision was made or not. There's a, there's a, there's a true um, documentation of how the decision was made. Um, so it also, um, it makes it unfortunate in this situation for the different parties, but in terms of board, the board's precedent that 18 decision doesn't uh, bind us in any way. Uh, is there, do we know of other circumstances like this that the board has addressed? And I'll open that then up to board members too. I, I feel like I vaguely remember issues along this line, but nothing specific. And so I, you welcome some of the longer tenured board members, if you guys have any recollection of previously addressing this kind of stuff and, and what you remember about thought process. Ty, um, Ty is that, on, I see your hand, I don't know, is that related to this or? Yeah, I guess it's, it's kind of a, a similar question. Um, I was just wondering if, if it, it sounds like the original engineer that reviewed the permit didn't know that there were, was a need for two sets of service lines and they approved it unilaterally without review process. Is that kind of what I'm, is that correct, Peter? Um, from what you understand of the legacy project, it just kind of went through the staff process, got approved. And if there was something that popped up or like a variance request, the board would have you know, addressed it, but it wasn't flagged. I will, I will, def I think that's what it is, but I'll defer to Sarah because she's done the research on it. Yeah, yeah, we just don't have great record from, from this specific case from 2018, but that, that would be my assumption as well. Right. Frankly, it was probably Sarah a mistake on staff's part. Did we, let me just confirm, did, I mean, did we make, did we go, did we review board mem minutes or anything else to, uh, confirm there was no action by the board on that one. We have not, but I will be happy to do that research. Okay. I mean, I would certainly, if we did debate this, I'd like to know about it. 18 wasn't all that long ago, but um, I'm sorry, I had a, I have another question, but I'm pausing while I try to remember it. Anyone else have anything they wanted to slide in while I, rethink all right um i think the and i'm sorry and, and peter i'm not sure if i didn't i didn't track in terms of uh do we know offhand just in terms of uh, uh townhomes being developed today where each unit is individually owned um, I, we'd have to go back and look at the code i'm, I'm not i i don't want to speak to what it says um because i don't know that part of the code inside and out but we can we can definitely go back and verify that. I think this is a this is a little bit different because we're we're basically establishing two distinctly separate properties. Yeah, the one thing I I mean I do I'm sensitive to is it's kind of like the where Don's question was too I think earlier, which is I mean well they're still not they're not two single family homes in the full sense of the term in terms of you know, setbacks on all four sides of the property. It's still, it's designed to be a duplex and it's designed to, I mean, we've allowed, you know, 50% ownership for one side and 50% for the other. Um, so there is obviously something unique about these properties that we've long um, accepted. Um, Marjan and then Red Tea. I just was wondering, Jeff, um, uh, this process, how much is it going to cost you extra? I mean, as far as like trying to avoid this, this process for you. So to, to put in the separate lines and everything, it looks like about a $45,000 expense. <clears throat> and, and how much does, does that, um, what is the outcome, is this outcome of this process? When you established uh, the, the two single homes, what are the gains for you? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning, Marjan. So your costs are about $45,000, correct? Yes. yes. 
Okay, so and out of that process, what are your your um, what are you expecting to gain as far as value of dollar? Can you kind of paint a picture of that for us for a moment? Sure. So so if I, okay. I just you know updating the duplex and, and selling it as a duplex versus going through this process, and <clears throat> that difference is about a hundred thousand dollars. So the extra forty five thousand will will chew into that a, a large amount. I can see why I can see your motivation to that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Red tea. Uh, yeah, let's uh, two things. So I guess we'll start with the most recent. Um, we understand the best cost to install the, these services, but we don't think it should be weighed against what Jeff's potential profits are for the property for owning it for 11 years. Had he bought it to yesterday and we were going through this process, he would have zero equity and be tasked with uh, the fee of $45,000 to $50,000 worth of improvements. So uh, we don't want to let that get skewed that, you know, we don't want you guys to think that Jeff is full of all this money, he can afford to do it. So we shouldn't grant him experience when it's really about the reality of what the situation is. Um, so then part two about that is if we go back to the party wall, the party wall is in place before a single property goes under CO. And so before each per potential new owner of this duplex purchases their half of the duplex, they will know exactly what they're required to maintain, exactly what they own as their property, and exactly what is responsible for the shared improvements, whether it's utilities, open space, shared walls, shared roofs, et cetera. So we believe, uh, we, we hear that it was an unfortunate situation that the legacy project that we're talking about went through a contentious resale. Um, our party wall, the way that we draft them will prevent that from happening. So we can clearly identify responsibilities, percentage ownerships, and how those payments will be processed through a management company. I have a question for Red T here. Um, I'm just curious. So the there's a big push to to get more real time water use data throughout kind of the the whole water industry right now. I understand the appeal of a property company being this great mediator in between, but how how do you feel or or, or yeah, I, th I think there's areas where they cannot provide what the the utility and, and the, the city would like to see. Um, like there's no way that the city will ever get data for each individual unit, despite how um, comprehensive the, the management plan is. Um, has there been any conversations about how, you know, you would be able to look at individual usage if the city was was interested with that or, or if the city, um, you know, eventually moves to, to full real time data monitoring. Um, this property would then be an outlier. How would, is, is there any way that, that you would respond to this or um, yeah, anything you would do in, in that aspect? That's a really great question. Um, to be honest, I wasn't, I hadn't heard that you guys were looking for data on this, but um, I'm wondering if, if, if we have effectively one tap with one service, we would know what the usage is of that tap and then the management company would either be divided 50-50 or a pro rata share based on how it's determined. So I wonder if we could achieve those same statistics with that single tap as you're looking for for a individual tap, uh, where we would assume that these two units are using X amount of water and you could divide it in half um, or the pro rata share as opposed to a single tap to a single unit. Is that something that would provide you the data that you're looking for? Or what additional um, data points would you might want? I was just thinking more in, in terms of, you know, you have that that front front lawn that Jeff showed, you have someone that's gonna be watering heavily and then you have the backside of the property that's pretty much zero scape. So, you know, a 50-50 breakdown doesn't give, give us much. And then in terms of, of data, you don't really know, you're not really able to allocate who's using what for what purpose at what time of the, the day, you just kind of have a, basically the equivalent of a, of a master meter, which I don't sure, think, sure. I don't think is a practice that you want for, for two single family units. I, I understand your question. Um, 
we could look into possibly putting a different kind of a meter or some kind after the line is T between the two units. Um, so that then we could get that data for our duplex units that you're looking for out of the single family detached units. Um, I would assume that there's has to be some way we could meter that after the T to get that data point for you. And then we could work out a system of some kind to relay that information back to your team. Yeah, I was I was just opening up for, for a question. I know that would create some problems having meters not under the direct authorization of the city. And um, as far as managing that data, you know, you you add another middleman. So I was just hoping to get your insight on it. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Let me know if you have any other questions. Um, I'll ask another. Uh, the Board of Adjustment and Appeals has a what pretty strict four part criteria for granting variances, um, things along the lines of hardship and uh, self imposed and all kinds of stuff. Uh, in terms of this board's consideration of variances, um, based on the code sections in front of us, it seems very uh, there's not a lot of direction. I just want to make sure do what criteria does this board have for how it evaluates variances? Is there any? I am I'm not aware of anything beyond what the code section says, but uh, if that's something you'd like us to go back and research and, and bring back at a uh, uh, at another time, um, we can we can definitely do that. I would be interested in formalizing that, John. I think that could be great documentation to have for this group, just so we have some, some formal, you know, check boxes. Yeah. Um, I would, uh, let me brainstorm here. I mean, I, um, I think there's, uh, I'm reading pretty strong concerns about uh, not dividing up the water lines, but I know um, I personally would like to make sure that we know how, I would like further confirmation that this board didn't address the 18 sewer line. Um, I'm still kind of surprised we don't have other examples to look at uh, and, and would like that. And then I, I think also having having input about our, uh, the way we should evaluate these requests. Um, you know, I think, well, somewhere in the presentation, I can't remember if it was um, uh, by Mr. Giesen or if it was in our own stuff, but the, I mean, the, the idea of hardship, uh, there's clearly what looks like a hardship in the sense of, there's a lot of destruction that has to happen to make, uh, you know, to make the, you know, to achieve this ideal of two separate water lines but um you know the again what goes before the board of adjustment appeals are things like well do you consider that a self-imposed hardship or not i mean this um anyway i think i think it's fair to look at this and say there's a there's a lot of a lot of destruction that has to happen just to um change what again on the surface isn't doesn't seem all that different from before so uh, i would be welcome for a little additional input before we actually went to a decision on this. And I, I assume that's our prerogative uh, to hold back on the vote, uh, gather more information and, and readjourn or reconvene later, whether that's next month or a special session to decide. Um, I mean, maybe Peter or Sarah, can you confirm that is that's one option before the board, if the board wishes to go that way today. That's correct. Like that, from, okay. That is one of the options that we that we presented, um, a, you know, an opportunity for us to go back and answer some of these questions. To your question about uh, disruption, a lot of times when we, we do replacement on water lines, we do a directional bore, which ultimately results in a four foot by four foot cut in the street. And then they directionally bore it straight to the house so you can eliminate any of the uh, disruption to any of the surface uh, treatments. So it's a little bit more expensive, but it does eliminate that hardship as it relates to uh, disruption to the surface. Uh, Jim, I see your hand raised. Oh, 
Yeah, I just want to bring up or suggest that this is self-imposed in that it was a rental property providing for two units as one rental property. I mean, it was one rental property with two, two units in it. And so in the change of that type of use, I, th I think it is somewhat self-imposed would be my opinion on that. Um, I would, yeah, I would, I certainly agree that's a, a perspective. Uh, I see Victoria McDermott's hand raised. Yeah, hi, no, I'm just a, I'm just a deputy student. I just wanted to um, recommend that to the extent that the board wanted to. And, and, and I'm sorry, I, I'm having trouble hearing Victoria. Can we try um, speaking a little closer to the mic? Absolutely. Is that any better? Uh, I'm, I'm still struggling. My yeah, it's, it's echoing pretty hard. Okay. Is that any better? Not, not really. Is it a handset versus speakerphone issue or just could, probably a computer problem? I think a computer problem. Um, I'll... I, I'm hearing you okay, go ahead. Oh, okay, I'm, I was just going to suggest that to the extent um, that the board wants to not, um, get more additional information that uh, there's a motion to continue to modify the date for it. It's not like it's, it's clear that this is a table of issue indefinitely or anything along those lines. And and I'm sorry, I lost that. If someone else picked up enough to repeat, I'd appreciate I it. I okay. I, I think what she was saying was that uh, we can table this to the next meeting and then bring up a, a motion on it to, at the next meeting. I think it's just more of a formal process of tabling the issue until the next meeting and then we'll we'll bring it up to uh, consideration at the next meeting. Is, is that correct, Victoria? Yeah, I apologize for the issues with the microphone. Yeah, and so it's more just a procedural. Okay, uh, Ty. Yeah, John, um, I, I was just wanted to comment on, on what you were saying about getting some more info on this. Uh, personally, I'm not sure that anything from the 2018, e even if the board did discuss it, would, would change my perspective, knowing we have different staff recommendations at this point, and um, I think are pretty aware of the precedent we're trying to set. I uh, just wanted to get my perspective out there as a board member on, on where I'm at with, with tabling this or reviewing more info. You know what, well, we uh, maybe to move us forward, you know what, Ty, maybe I'll suggest this. If you would like to make a motion um, that's bringing this to vote, I will follow your motion with a motion to table, and the board can decide whether or not to table it or not. Uh, would that work for you? Sure. Okay. Um, so the mo yeah, the motion we're going to be looking for, uh, well, let's just get back to where, uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, if you want to work from that. Uh, sure, I'll pop in. So I'm, I'm looking to move to recommend the city manager approve or deny based on the board's recommendation. The yeah, I'm sorry, Ty, that, that's the key. Um, I'm looking ahead to, make <laughs> uh, to bring it to, a, how do you want to formally do this? What, what's the so language? It, uh, uh, assuming you would be leaning to denying it, then you move to recommend the city manager deny the variance request for the proposed property separation at 3106 South Dakota. Okay, and then you're gonna move to table it to the next meeting. That's right. Okay. Perfect. So I'm going to move to recommend the city manager deny the variance request for the proposed property separation at 3106 South Tacoma Street. Can I get a second on that? I will second that. Okay. Uh, then I'm going to interject with a, a motion to table um, the vote on this until the next session. Um, if no one wants to wait, then don't bother seconding my motion. Is there a second for my motion? A second. Okay. Uh, 
so the discussion at this moment would be about the motion to table, not the original motion. Um, is there any discussion about tabling this till our next meeting so we can have further input? Yeah. Okay, then uh, those in favor of tabling uh, the original motion until our next meeting, uh, please say aye. 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 Um, Brenda, I'm not sure if you're picking up. I'm thinking that's a majority, but I didn't catch. Yeah, it sounded like a majority. I was watching the screen too. Okay. Uh, the motion to table carries. Uh, we'll ask um, staff for the additional, dis uh, to help us with the additional di uh, discussion items we had or informational items we requested. Um, uh, Mr. Geese and I, have, um, I know this, you probably write, like resolution, but I really appreciate your time and your patience as we try to get this right. Uh, it's a big issue for you and it's a big issue for the city. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, we will resume on this issue next, uh, next month. Uh, I, we need to move on, so I don't want to engage in further discussion, but if there's anything critical, then please just jump in briefly. Can I just Before confirm one thing, Chair? Uh, so yes. what we'll do is we'll go back and look at the review of the discussion and come together with a list of, of points that we think uh, we're, we're looking for further uh, investigation and then confirm those with you to ensure that that meets the list, and then we'll bring that back to the next meeting. Yes. Perfect. Is there anything that uh, we need to provide to you? Uh, if there is, we'll follow up. I don't think it, at this point, I think it's on the uh, city side. You guys have been, I appreciate you've had, you've made a great presentation and I think you've laid out the facts nicely from your, from your end. Well, well thank you okay. for the consideration. Do we, Our, oh. What is the date of this next meeting? When when should we be prepared for that? Is that in two weeks? No, it's a uh, second Tuesday every month. Okay, same Thank time. You. Yes. All right. Uh, very good. I appreciate it. We're going to move on. Um, uh, so to the board, uh, obviously this was a. Uh, complex issue taking up a lot of time. Um, Peter, I'm going to just have this go through this again. I'm going to use the to the extent we know something can slide to the next meeting. Let's do that. But otherwise, we, we'll push through the, the business we need to handle. So what I would say is the two action items we think we can be pretty quick on. They're pretty straightforward. Uh, B and okay. C. And then when we get into the other business, uh, we can probably summarize all that in about 45 seconds. All right, let's go. <laughs> Okay, I'll quickly address the uh, request for modern um, water line replacement construction. Um, so following the master plan, there's been a program put together, an annual water line replacement program. Uh, the first year is this year where we've identified installing new um, hydrants and mains uh, in seven sites across the city that, would, that have been focused on water quality and fire flow. So kind of what that means is these um, areas shown in blue here are really dead ends. So we're looking to close loops, which improves water quality. It also increases our fire flow capacity. Uh, so these sites have been uh, packaged into one project. We put it out to bid and two contractors responded. Um, the selected contractor is Black Eagle Energy Services. They had a sound approach to complete the work and they had the lowest bid of 1,100,000 uh, and, and the change. <laughs> so uh, I, with that, I'll open it up for any questions, but this is a part of our annual water line replacement and is within the utilities budget. Any questions? Uh, all right, Ty, go ahead. Sir, have we used this contractor on any of the previous main replacements? I actually don't know the answer to that. Uh, Peter, do you know? Uh, I don't believe we've used them as a, uh, on main replacements here. Uh, I believe we have used them for piping at uh, South Platte Renew. Uh, I do recognize the company name and I believe they did a project at South Platte Renew. Thanks. Great. Uh, Marjan, go ahead. 
Um, Peter, just quick question. Um, when they do these kind of jobs, these contractors, do you guys check their work? Yeah, we uh, we actually have inspection of their work. So that's part of, the, of, of what we do. Sometimes that'll be conducted by the actual design engineer. Sometimes that'll be the in our in-house inspection uh, crews, which is typically done through public works. As we start to implement our, our capital program, we, are, we will be hiring our own capital inspector that's uh, scheduled for late this year, early next year. Uh, so we do verify that the work is being installed correctly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see, can I get a motion to recommend city council approve by motion, a contract for services with Black Eagle Engineering in Energy Services for water main construction in the amount of $1,112,000, including approval to execute any change orders if necessary to extend a 10% staff managed, managed contingency amount of $111,200 for a total project authorization of uh, $1,223,200. So moved. I'll second. second. Perfect. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? All right, motion carries. Uh, 5C. Okay, this uh, we can make this one quick. So uh, if you've been down to the Allen Water Treatment Plant lately, lately, you'll see that there are a number of trailers as we have staffed up uh, utilities, we have had to bring in trailer resources to uh, um, adequately staff the uh, management and um, operational staff at the at the Allen Treatment Plant. So we have we have a larger project which is looking at utilities as a whole, and um, that's more focused on on the service center, which we will be coming to you probably next year sometime in terms of a recommendation on how to move forward with a. A, a, a new utility center. Uh, however, at the Allen plant, we do have needs uh, relative to operations and maintenance staff, our water treatment manager, and, and just the, the way this plant was originally built, there was not a lot of consideration for office space. We actually have a unique uh, area on uh, along the top of the filters that we think it's pretty seamless and easy to, well, all right, it's pretty seamless We'll see how easy it is once we get into construction to uh, um, add for uh, a uh, conference room as well as some additional offices for those uh, management and staff. Um, next slide. Uh, we, we're, we're approaching this in, in, as, a, as a carve out from that larger project. EDOS is our, uh, our architect on the, on the larger project. We've pulled this out. This is a, a, a contract to complete design services through design and construction management services through the completion of the project. We will be proposing this project as a construction management uh, general contractor delivery approach, which is a common approach used for when you are working in existing systems. We've utilized this approach uh, several times successfully at South Platte Renew. Um, it's, it's different than the design bid build approach and it, what it does is it helps to eliminate uh, surprises and potential change orders and really locks in pricing. So this first step is to get the engineer on board, then we'll do a, uh, we, we actually are in process and have solicited for an RFQ for a, a uh, construction contractor which will be coming at a future meeting uh, with a recommendation for. Uh, next slide. And so really this is getting us Moving forward on addressing uh, some of the larger staffer staff issues that we have uh, uh, as it relates to housing those staff and, and creating modernized facilities. Any questions for Peter? All right, seeing none, uh, can we get a motion? I get a motion to recommend that city council approve by motion an optimal source professional service agreement with EDOS Architects PC for architectural and engineering design services for our office space improvements at the Allen Water Treatment Plant in the amount of $199,607, including approval to execute any change orders if necessary to extend a 10% staff managed contingency amount of $19,967 for a total project authorization of 219,637. 
it's a mouthful. I'll move that forward. Would you repeat it for me, Jim? Just kidding. Second, please. Thanks. <laughs> All right. All in favor. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, any further discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, motion carries. All right. Old business, city ditch. Okay, uh, really quickly on this, there was a question a few months back when we looked at the um, the city ditch users agreement and how we divvied up the the, the proportionate share of maintenance. And one of the questions was there's unallocated uh, volume that's associated with Denver Waters uh, rights to run water through the through the ditch. We went back and researched. It's pretty explicitly clear in those agreements that we cannot charge maintenance costs against those um, against that unallocated water. And so that we had Berg Hill, our water resources attorney, look into that uh, because it was a question that was raised by the board and we just wanted to circle back and follow up. All right, so, uh, all right, so no questions. And then staff's choice. I will I'm run through, uh, 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 I can run through quickly. Uh, the first is South Platte Renew Open House. We would like to welcome anybody, any and all, to come to our open house. We haven't had it in a couple of years. It's on August 10th. It's from three to six. It's over at South Platte Renew. It's a great opportunity to come and see the plant and, and come see the work there. Uh, we will skip the management conference presentation and uh, someday we'd like to show the, to go through the, the timeline of, of, of what's been accomplished so far and then what's what's uh, what what's uh, in the future for us, but we can uh, kick that to a future meeting. Uh, additionally, we I just wanted to let, her, the, let the board know that the RFP for the city ditch piping project hit the street today. So we are excited about that. It's a, it's a little bit far delayed in terms of our timing on this, um, but uh, we're excited that it's finally out on the street and we'll start to get, uh, we'll have a uh, pre-proposal meeting next Friday we're expecting a lot of interest from a number of consultants on that project. Uh, additionally, I wanted to address uh, some recent staffing issues. Uh, we had another resignation of a key leadership person in utilities, Angela Goodman, resigned uh, this past month. Uh, it was actually the day after last month's board meeting. Her last day was last Friday. Um, it, is, it is a loss. However, one of the things that Angela uh, really worked in there, Angela was here for two years, um, much like uh, similar to Steve. And in that two years, what Angela really focused on seemed like the entire time she was hiring. And in, in that hiring, what she was able to do was establish bench strength in utilities that we have not had for a long time. So uh, we have uh, Josh Roach, who's been here for a year. He's the, uh, Josh is on the, on the line here. Uh, so he is our, was, he's our distribution and collections manager. He has stepped in as interim deputy director of O&M for the time being while we recruit for that position. Uh, additionally, Josh uh, came to us from Missouri and uh, recruited away one of his key staff from uh, his utility back in Missouri who started this month. So adding some uh, bench strength within uh, operations and maintenance. Additionally, we hired a, um, a water treatment manager uh, who was a 24-year veteran of Denver Water, um, Zach Alabasi. Uh, Ty, you might know the name. Uh, so Zach started with us uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and he brings a tremendous amount of expertise and knowledge, which will help stabilize the operations of the Allen plant. So even with Angela's departure, we're able to, to backfill with uh, highly qualified personnel to move operations and forward operations maintenance forward, which two years ago we would not have been able to say we could do if, if she departed. So uh, it's a testament to the work that she did. She did a lot of great work for a couple of years. Um, it's sad that we didn't have a meeting where I could say this publicly uh, with her there, but it was really she did some great work for two years and really set this place up um, to succeed into the into the future. Um, both Steve and Angela went to consulting. And so we are in a challenging environment as it relates to uh, uh, com competition, both not just from the public sector, but also in the private sector. And so it's an, it's somewhat of a new dynamic as it relates to, um, as it relates to retaining and, and filling key positions. Um, really the rest of the, the, 
the rest of the department, we actually don't have uh, a, a, a substantial amount of vacancies. So we're, I'm less concerned about that. It's at those deputy director levels that uh, we've taken a bit of a hit over the last few months. So with that, another announcement is Sarah Stone has agreed to step in as interim deputy director of engineering in addition to her deputy director du uh, role uh, duties uh, as business solutions deputy director. So I wanna thank Sarah for stepping up. So between Josh and Sarah, I think we've been able, we'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to weather the storm on this for the next few months as we uh, try, attempt to recruit for these positions. Thank you for that and update. I, and I think that is it for staff's choice. Um, I'll give the board members a chance to jump in. Um, if there's anything before we adjourn? Hearing nothing. All right. Thank you, everyone. This meeting is adjourned. Uh, have a good evening. Thanks Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.